Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Terry Rich, and I am co-founder and CFO of Joshua's Gift. Like many families, we have a child living with a disability. Our son, Joshua, is on the autism spectrum. Miss and I started our foundation because we wanted to take the lessons learned with Joshua and help other families like us who have a child or adult with autism or some other disability. We are currently serving and supporting the disability community while educating and encouraging others to be inclusive, accepting, and respectful of our families. They say family is a gift that lasts forever. Well, our son Joshua is truly a treasure and our daughter loves her big brother so much and their relationship is such a blessing. Our family and community continue to be a source of unwavering strength and we are so overjoyed to share that love and support with you. Under normal circumstances prior to COVID-19, Joshua's gift had been providing families who have a child or adult with disabilities opportunities to experience typical family outings, such as ball games, concerts, family dining, movies, jump parties, and amusement park outings without the stress of financial burdens. Since COVID-19, families who are supporting are losing their jobs all while trying to take care of their children with special health care needs and disabilities. Joshua's gift is stepping in to help ease their struggles. Whether we are providing food, household needs, school supplies, or PPE, our foundation is helping meet the needs of our community. Speaking of meeting the needs of our community, Dave Clark, who's the anchor for KTVU's Mornings on Two, is one of those individuals as well who is doing a lot in the autism community and the community of disabilities as well. Dave is a veteran on television and radio, and as a broadcaster, he is an, he has had an illustrious career. His career has included major media markets such as New York, Los Angeles, Washington D.C., Philadelphia, and Dave is also a sought-after national keynote speaker announcer and panel moderator. When he's not spending quality time though with his family and friends like us, Dave is contributing his skills and talents and life experiences as a prominent advocate for the disabilities community. He is also a parent of a son, his son who is diagnosed with autism. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dave Clark. Mr. Kerry, thank you. Thank you. Thank you to our wonderful panel. Thank you for you being here with us. Yes, I'm Dave Clark. I'm very happy to be here. This is a special, special event, a very, very special day. We have some talented, wonderful people on the panel here, and I want you to meet them all. I just want to point out that, yeah, I am a dad. I have firsthand knowledge of autism. I have a son. David Emanuel, who's 27 years old. He's also not only diagnosed autistic, he has a seizure disorder. He has seizures in his sleep. So I know certain things firsthand. And he's a young man who I love and he makes my life complete. So as I stand before you, and I'm so glad to be here with you, I'm ready to listen and learn from our wonderful panelists. And I really, really appreciate all that MISPA and Kerry have done through the organization and our wonderful sponsors, Kaiser Permanente, and of course, the wonderful people at Cisco. But I want to get right to the people who are going to, we're going to talk and learn. And I want to tell you who's on the panel today. I'm going to begin with Dr. Jesse Sherrod, pediatrician, an infectious disease specialist, a healthcare epidemiologist. Among other things, she was the first student from Tougaloo College in Mississippi to go to the Harvard Medical School. She was the first black physician, the first inductee into the UCLA School of Public Health Hall of Fame. And among many other things, she was the founder of the Association of Black Women Physicians in Los Angeles, 
uh, a very, very prestigious uh, organization. Dr. Sherrod, I'm so glad that you're here. Next, I want to tell you about Patrick Romzek, a retired IT executive at Cisco Systems. He was Cisco's vice president of worldwide cloud strategy. Patrick now uh, provides executive leadership on inclusion and transformative employment for people with disabilities. And another thing about Patrick, and we bonded over this, Patrick's also a dad of a son diagnosed autistic. Sheridan Nicolau, uh, the Bay Area Regional Manager for the State Council on Developmental Disabilities, she makes sure and her organization makes sure the Californians with intellectual and developmental disabilities can get support and services they need to live independently. So she's very, very important. John Marble. John is the founder of Pivot. He's a strategist. He's a communicator on workforce policy, innovation, and neurodiversity. He has served, among other things, within the Obama administration in a variety of, uh, of areas related to his field. He lives in San Francisco. And more importantly, John has a perspective. John is diagnosed autistic. Lucretia D. Clark a certified lifestyle enthusiast, speaker, a coach, an artist, a talented author, just an incredible person with wonderful insight. And she is here as well. Last but not least, L. Vance Taylor, the Chief of the Officer of Access and Functional Needs at the Governor's Office of Emergency Services. A focus, what to do before, during, after a disaster for people with disabilities and developmental needs. That is our panel of experts. We are going to talk and be, have a freewheeling discussion and take your questions and learn a lot from this wonderful panel of experts. And let me say to each one of you, collectively, I'm thrilled to be here with you. There's much to do and we're gonna start right now and I'm going to start with Dr. Sherrod. And again, our experts, please feel free to listen, jump in if you feel necessary. Dr. Sherrod, I know, among other things, the COVID-19 virus is a major issue for you. Why is it such an issue, and particularly relating to autism and what families should know and what they should do? Uh, first, thank you for that uh, generous introduction. It is indeed a pleasure to uh, participate in such uh, an outstanding and diverse panel. And I, I want to thank Joshua Tree, I'm, I'm sorry, Joshua's gifts, <laughs> for all of the work that they do and for giving me this opportunity. I think the theme is quite appropriate in giving hope while I'm making change. And there's no better time to talk about this than during the COVID-19 pandemic, which is the greatest pandemic of the century. And we haven't had one like this since 1918. So that means that our lives will change forever. And I think the most important thing for us is to know how to prevent and how to protect ourselves, how to prevent getting infected. And secondly, how to protect ourselves uh, during our general regular lifestyles. So it's important because this virus uh, is an RNA virus. Uh, we think it originated in Wuhan, China. That's where the first epidemic occurred. And they believe that it came from bats. The problem is that it has such, it is very virulent. It has a great um, mortality. Now there are three factors that you have to consider anytime you encounter infection. The first, these three factors determine whether you get infected or not. The first is that you have to look at the status of the immune host. And that's very important when we're looking at children with autism. They already have damage to their immune system. They have what we call a compromised immune system. That's the major factor in determining whether you're going to become infected. Also, if you have underlying comorbidities. The second important factor is 
the exposure. And that's where the prevention comes in. The amount of time you're exposed to the virus and the amount of viral load that you're exposed to is a major factor in determining whether you get infected. And the third thing is the virulence of the organism. As we know, COVID-19 is very virulent. The mortality has been great among uh, many different populations, but especially among those who have pre-existing conditions. And we know about the disproportionate amount of mortality that we've seen in various uh, low-income communities, in people with disabilities, in people with pre-existing conditions. So that's why it's so important for us to talk about how to protect ourselves from this virulent organism. Doctor, doctor, let me jump in real quick, and then I'm going to go to uh, I'm going to go to John Marble. But first, Doctor, is there anything? Now, I, I'm a parent of a son who's not only diagnosed autistic, has seizures in his sleep, but the seizures took away his speech. My son doesn't speak. I've right. never once heard my son say, "Hi, Dad." What do you do? How do you find out? I don't know what to even give to my son to protect him. Uh, what would you say to someone like me, a family like mine? Well, a family like yours, first uh, and, and foremost, you should follow the guidelines that have been recommended for protecting yourself. Each person has an individual responsibility for protecting themselves and their household. So you would actually have primary responsibility for your son and that he doesn't have full responsibility for himself. We need to have our protective, personal protective equipment. Now, for you, if you're not in the healthcare setting, you would be wearing a mask and you would make sure your, your um, son wears a mask if you take him out to the grocery store or out in public. That's been recommended. Now, one of the most important things is hand washing. We know that this is a respiratory virus. It's spread primarily by respiratory droplets and through contact with surfaces that's been contaminated. So. The droplets actually can stay in the air, they say, from three hours to maybe even longer. And through coughing and talking and sneezing, the virus can go as far as six feet, and some people think maybe 32 feet. But we're using the six feet now. So uh, we have to make sure that we do the social distancing, which is recommended by our authorities. Uh, those are the guidelines from the CDC and from the uh, NIH. And also, you have to wash your hands frequently and for 20 seconds using a foaming soap. Now, there are other things that you can use like sanitizers, but the sanitizers must have at least 60% alcohol in order to be protected. But the best thing is soap and water and washing your hands. You want to disinfect surfaces in your home, doorknobs, handrails, counters on a regular basis. Because what happens is when we talk, we can, or sneeze, or cough, or while we're talking, sometimes we spit. Those droplets will fall on counters. You touch those counters with your hand, and then your hands go immediately to your face. So one of the things I've been emphasizing is that be conscious of where you're putting your hands. Keep your hands out of your face because the virus tends to enter through your nose, your nasal passages, your eyes, or your mouth. We have to be very careful with washing our hands first and then making sure we're not putting our hands in our faces. Um, if you're a healthcare worker, uh, you need a specific mask, and that's the N95 mask, which is reserved for healthcare workers, in fact. And the reason they use that is because it's more protective than the regular surgical mask. That mask has a filter in it, it has a helper filter, and that's why it's better for healthcare workers to wear, wear that mask because it protects them from getting the virus through inhalation. Um, the protective equipment, if you're a healthcare worker, is the gown and gloves. And it's very important, I, I would like to recommend the CDC.gov website for looking at how you put on and take off protective equipment because that's very important in whether you infect yourself or not, how you take off your protective or personal protective equipment. So actually now they're covering their whole face, their head, because it can land in your hair. 
and you're wearing a gown and gloves. Now, some people in the lay public are also utilizing gloves, like when they go to the grocery store because they're picking up things that other people have touched. So I tend to put on gloves, and then as I leave, I take the gloves off because you're trying to keep from picking up germs from other people from items that they may have touched and contaminated. But those are some of the things that you can do. Now, the most important thing is boosting up your immune system. That's the one major factor. That's the number one factor, the status of your immune system. So that means that if you have underlying coexisting, pre-existing conditions, you definitely want to take your vitamin C, vitamin D, vitamin E, and your omega-3 fatty acids, and your minerals. Minerals are very, very important, like selenium, zinc, and magnesium. And I'm not prescribing here because these are just nutritional supplements that you want to utilize to boost up your immune system. Because we know there is no drug now that's confirmed by evidence to actually cure COVID-19. So we have to make every effort and use all of our knowledge to try to prevent getting it. So that means social distancing, washing our hands, um, wearing your personal protective equipment, and staying at home as much as possible, especially during these times while we're trying to figure out what's going on. Now, also testing. Testing is very, very important because it gives you an idea of the true mortality rate. Right now, we're getting inflated rates because we don't have the proper denominator because not enough people have been tested. That has been a major challenge for the United States, and I don't understand that. Why? the richest country in the world is having problems getting basic equipment. What it points out is that, is that the public health infrastructure has not been given kind of attention that is needed. So this pandemic caught us totally unprepared, disorganized, unprepared, and we still don't have a coordinated plan coming from the Center for Disease Control from the top for controlling this epidemic. There are five important points for controlling an epidemic. And they are social distancing, testing, contact tracing, isolation, and quarantine. Those are major factors. And there's actually an article written by a gentleman from uh, Harvard School of Public Health named Jim Yoon Kim. He lays out, he's a pandemic uh, specialist. He actually worked with the Ebola pan pandemic. And he lays out a five-point program for getting this pandemic under control. And those are the five elements that I just enumerated. And I am praying somebody will hire him to organize an approach for us in the United States because we are going to be dealing with this for a while at the rate we're going. Our plan is not coordinated. We are the United States, so we can't have one state doing this and some one state doing something else. Then you have borders which you can cross. So we're going to be dealing with this for a while because we, our approach has not been ideal. Dr. Sherrod, Dr. Sherrod, great information. You, you touched on a lot of different things. We'll get back to that. Let me ease over, and I'm going to talk to all of our panels here, but John Marble, I want to go to you right now because I wanted to get your thoughts as a man among uh, who's done so many different things but who's also diagnosed autistic. Uh, how does it, the words of Dr. Sherrod, how does it strike your ear and I don't know if you feel like talking about some of the recent health experiences sure. you've gone through. Sure. Uh, well, I have been diagnosed with COVID-19 positive, and everything that Dr. Sherrod says, uh, my doctor has told me as well, as well as my uh, accountability partner, whose father is an epidemiologist, who's repeated all of those same things as well. Um, it's been a very rocky month for me. Um, sometimes people describe me as high functioning, which I don't like that term. I like high masking. I'm 43 years old. I've learned how to blend into neurotypical society. Um, but I'm also masking a bit here too, that uh, I'm 
sitting here talking to you as soon as this is over, my doctor has me back in bed resting uh, because even though I'm a month on, I'm still dealing with complications from this disease. Um, there's a bridge that goes back to the question that you asked Dr. Sherrod about how to protect ourselves, uh, whether we're disabled ourselves or family members. And one thing that's really helped me in this process is the concept of self-advocacy, which disabled advocates talk about a lot, it actually came originally from autistic advocates. And it's something that I teach my own autistic students. There's four components in self-advocacy that I really think will help families as they interact with the healthcare system around COVID-19. Uh, the first point in self-advocacy is just knowing who you are. You mentioned that your son has seizures, I have seizures too. Um, uh, so many of the things that you say about your son, I just instantly light up about. But it took me a long time in life to even recognize that. I didn't even realize that I had seizures in my sleep until about five years ago when I had a sleep test. And my doctor pointed that out. And taking that course changed my life, but I didn't know who I was. So at that point, I knew I was somebody with seizures. At that point, I knew I was somebody with autism. That's the first point in self-advocacy is really understanding who you are. The second point of the four points is understanding your normalcy. Yes, I might have seizures. I might be autistic, but I am just as normal as anyone else. A friend of mine might use a um, ventilator to breathe. She is just as normal as anybody else. Uh, my friend Sarah um, has Down syndrome. She is just as normal as I am, as my roommate is, who's a neurotypical person without any disabilities. Um, and that leads to the third point of knowing how to stand in confidence of that. I don't know if you can see, but I have a, a pillow behind me of my favorite author, uh, who is James Baldwin. And a lot of times when uh, disabled people are trying to understand themselves, disabled adults are really trying to understand themselves. They might ask me, what can I read to really understand myself as a disabled person? And I always say, read James Baldwin. And James Baldwin wrote nothing of disability. He was a gay black man in the United States who wrote about society and race. But the thread through so much of his writing was just the sheer normalcy of the individual and how bizarre it is for another person to, to treat us differently just because of difference. So once you understand your normalcy and you have confidence in standing in who you are, then you can get to the fourth point of self-advocacy, which is advocating for yourself and claiming your space and claiming the things that you need to do. I'll give you one example from my life pre-COVID-19. I went to uh, the doctor and they were doing a blood pressure uh, check and my blood pressure was through the roof. And all of a sudden they became very concerned about it. I realized who I was as an autistic person. I said, you know what? I actually forgot my headphones today my noise canceling headphones and I've been in this very noisy, very bright waiting room for an hour. Uh, could you put me in a separate room just for three minutes that doesn't have noise and retake my blood pressure? They did and my blood pressure was normal. Uh, uh, Sheridan and I were on our uh, RAC meeting for the State Council of Developmental Disabilities last night a parent was there uh, saying the same thing about her daughter uh, who has a lot of sensory issues, who has problems with needles, and learning how to say to uh, the healthcare professional who thinks you're being difficult, uh, who thinks that the person with sensory differences might be acting up to say, no, this is who my daughter is, this is what her needs are, um, and this is what we need. And I know that might sound simple, <laughs> but it's it's one of the hardest things that you can learn. And it transfers to, to other populations as well. It, but knowing who you are, understanding yourself, um, advocating for yourself, especially in the healthcare system with COVID-19, um, will, will help save your life. Um, it helped save my life with this when I knew that a lot of times some autistic people have a trouble distinguishing different pains. Um, and a lot of us tend to have higher pain thresholds. And so as adults, if we're living on our own, it could 
take a lot for us to go to the doctor unless we have a spouse saying, hey, you need to go to the doctor. But getting to that point of recognizing, I think this is the time that I need to call my doctor, calling my doctor and saying, you need to go to the emergency room, I was in the hospital twice with COVID-19 complications, and being able to say to the doctor, I am autistic, I am experiencing this chest pain, I don't know if it's a sharp pain or a dull pain, I can't tell if it's my lungs or my heart, uh, just that help the healthcare professionals uh, better assist me. Uh, so I hope I hope that was helpful advice to you. And thank you so much uh, for sharing the, the story about your son because I, I just resonate with that so much. John, I, I just resonate with you. You, you. you taught me another lesson. You've been teaching me many lessons and I identify with you relating to my son and I expect to learn so much more from you and all of our panels, uh, panelists. Uh, yeah. I was just going to say, I always say that one of the best things about being an autistic adult is coming to be friends with people who have autistic children, because I feel like I can be a bridge between the two and translate between the two. I relate to my friends as adults and their kids as autistic, and they learn a lot about their kids from, from being with an autistic adult. And truthfully, I learn a lot about myself by observing their kids and things I've done all my life that I haven't realized were related to autism. All of a sudden, I realize, oh, yeah, that's an autistic trait that I do. Well, you are a great teacher, John. And all of our panelists, sit tight for just a moment. I'm coming to Lucretia and Mispa and Kerry and, and uh, Patrick and also uh, Sherrod. And I'll get back to you and get to you in just a moment. But first, I, I, want, I want to show a video right now. One of the truly great people here in the Bay Area is a wonderful television news anchor at Cron for TV. I love her. She's a friend. She loves Joshua's gift. I'd like you to see Pam Moore. Hello, everyone. My name is Pam Moore with Cron4 News, and I want to join the Joshua's Gift Foundation in saying thank you, especially to those in the special needs community and their families. It's so important to say thank you for efforts big and small by those on the front line. And frankly, right now, all efforts are big. The doctors and nurses, the orderlies and janitors, police, fire, EMTs, the grocery and postal workers, transit, food service workers, farm workers, security guards, and more. It takes courage and compassion to step out when everyone else is told to stay at home. The world is upside down, but you are still there. Even from behind a mask, I try to stop and say thank you. Thank you for taking care of all of us right now. I am grateful. You are appreciated. Thank you. More one of the truly great ladies, uh, and I, we appreciate her help and support and her her encouragement. I want to go to Patrick right now. Patrick, you're you're in Michigan, and I'm going to ease on into everyone else. But Patrick Romzek, a retired IT executive from Cisco, now working in executive leadership, focusing on inclusion and transformative employment for people with disabilities, among the many things we're gonna talk about as we put a face on autism. Patrick, I'm so glad you're here. And I think as I, as I look ahead for my son and others, uh, like my son, getting a job, particularly as we're evolving right now, uh, it seems daunting. Uh, what can you do, what can you say in, in your field of work that families need to hear? Well, th thank you, Dave, and, and, and thanks as well to Ms. Pa and Joshua's Gift for putting this together. I think, you know, it's a very impressive group of experts, um, and I'm honored to be part of this. Uh, so, Dave, maybe to take a step back for those of you, the Cisco people that might be watching, I, I worked at, I walked many miles in your shoes. So I was at Cisco for 17 years until I retired a couple years ago. And when I say that I'm providing executive advice, the reality of it is I'm trying to help people uh, achieve employment, uh, people with disabilities to achieve employment and helping organizations hire people with disabilities because that's my passion um, driven from my son and the inspiration from my son and some of the things I learned over the years from Sheridan and others. But the reality of it is many, many people with disabilities are capable of far more than most people think. 
um, you know, we just heard a minute ago, right? I mean, we heard from John very articulate in, in outlining, you know, sort of the, the notion of self-awareness and recognizing what your capabilities are and having confidence. I see that every single day. So the, the, the story, the backstory here for me is when I was at Cisco, I led a group of people in both collaboration and then in, in sales enablement. I worked for Mark Patterson for a number of years. And we started a hiring program. Sheridan was actually part of this pilot we did. And we were trying to hire people with disabilities. And what we found is that they were more productive than their coworkers in jobs at Cisco. We hired people at Cisco with disabilities. They had higher productivity, lower error rates, higher customer satisfaction scores, lower turnover, lower absenteeism, but they often lacked self-confidence, kind of what John was talking about. So it wasn't always evident to us, and we had to have an outreach strategy to hire those people, and in some cases had to provide them education in order for them to, to transition into the employment, into real, into real jobs. I call them real jobs, knowledge worker jobs. Um, and that was quite successful. But when I left, uh, Dave, uh, when I retired a couple years ago, I was asked first by the city of New York and then by other organizations to help them do similar things as to what we had done at Cisco. So I did. I used the Cisco Network Academy program, which many of you know about. And we were able to train people with disabilities who had the capability, maybe lacked the confidence or the education, but they had the capability for meaningful jobs we trained them in those jobs, transitioned them into the jobs, and changed their life. And it was a, it's a very powerful story about economic empowerment and the, the idea that having a job is transformative, right? Everybody on this broadcast has a job. Well, think about how much more meaning your life, you get out of your, your, your job in terms of your life, right? Self-esteem and the economic self-sufficiency that a job entails. It's the same for a person with a disability because, as, as, as John said, they're, they're normal. I mean, you, people think of them as not typical, whatever. They're very normal, and they think the same way, and they feel the same way, and my son does. And, Dave, I'm sure your son does. Yeah, my son's brain is wired differently than maybe a typical kid or the kid next door, but it doesn't mean he feels things any differently. He's driven by his own opportunity to have impact, self-esteem and self-sufficiency. He doesn't want to be dependent on anybody. Giving someone a job transforms their life because it gives them self-esteem and it creates economic empowerment to allow them to live their, a better life. And it helps the family live a better life and eliminates a whole bunch of worry for people like you and I, Dave, parents of kids with disabilities that worry about what's going to happen to them. Well, we don't have to worry about it. They can take care of themselves. So. I believe that employment is transformative, and that's why I've dedicated my, my retirement years to trying to make a difference in the area of employment. Patrick, I'm not supposed to say I love you, but I love you. I mean, you, you, really, you really touch me deeply. And before, you, before I ease on, I'm going to come to Lucretia Clark next but the, and then go to Sheridan, but I've got, I just got to ask you, how has being a dad of a son diagnosed uh, autistic, how has that changed you? Oh, it, it's changed me in ways I could never describe. I mean, it's the greatest blessing of my life is having a son with a disability. I, I'm much more aware and conscious of people's capabilities. I look at people as people. I don't look at them. I don't label them. I don't. I, I just. I'm more empathetic, I think, and more understanding is the way I would describe it, Dave. And and I'm sure it resonates with you. You probably are more empathetic and understanding of other people because of your your you know your family life. And and the same for me. It's also inspired me because I recognize the capabilities people have, no matter what their limitations are. People with disabilities often, all they want is a chance. Your son, my son, all he wants is a chance. He wants a chance to prove himself. And if you give them that chance, they will prove themselves. Um, all they really need is to get to the first step of the ladder, and they'll take it from there. But they need help sometimes to get to the first step because of all the disadvantages they have from the time they're born. Um, so I've learned, I've learned more than I could probably describe, and I don't want to take too much of the time here. But... It's um, both inspiration and understanding, Dave. 
I agree. I agree with you totally. I tell people all the time, I'm a television news anchor. I'm on the news every day, but I tell people there are things that I never would have known if I had not been the father of David Emmanuel, a son diagnosed autistic. And there are stories that you know, the types of stories that end up on the news uh, there. I, I feel them more than I think I ever would have if I had not been David's dad and some of the experiences I've gone through. I, I talk about that all the time. Uh, uh, sorry, and I'm going to come to you and just yeah, go ahead, Patrick. I was just going to say, Dave, you've learned more from your son and I've learned for, more from my son than he'll ever learn from me. And I, in, in different ways, right? And that's kind of what you're speaking to. And let me just add to that, piggyback on that. I tell, another thing I tell people all the time, I've never heard David one time say, hi, dad, because his seizures occur in the part of the brain that took away his speech. So for 27 years, he and I have communicated without speaking, but he tells me he loves me every day. Absolutely. I hear him. He's the center of my home. And um, I, I, I'm not eloquent enough say how much I love him and what he has brought. God has taught me through a young man who doesn't speak. Yeah. It's, it's a fascinating way to live, and I know you, you understand what I'm saying. Absolutely. Yes. And Lucretia Clark, I'm going to move over to you real quick. Uh, you speak, you're, you're very sensitive, you're very talented. All of this that we've been talking about to this point, how has this affected you and what thoughts pop into your mind? First and foremost, the, just the expertise and the vast knowledge of everyone on this panel, it has taught me, um, it's, it's enlightened my awareness about the needs of this special community, particularly of uh, special needs individuals that are living with autism. But not only for the individuals living with autism, but their family members, as well as their communities, you know, living with this. And as we're going through this change, this new cultural change, this new way of life because of COVID-19, there's so much stress that's being brought upon the individuals, you know, in our families, for everyone. So it's very important that as we navigate through this pandemic and through this new way of life, because, hey, it is going to be a new way of life from this day forward. There are things that individuals need to uh, be mindful of so that they will stay healthy. Um, there's a lot of stress because of the anxiety, because of the high level of uncertainty. Uh, we are all experiencing more stress now than ever before. And not to say, and let's, let's be frank about this, individuals and families living with autism and other special needs have a lot of stress anyway. So this is compounded now, and we have to be very mindful of how we take care of ourselves with self-care. Very well said. Let me ease over to Sheridan Nicolau. You're the Bay Area Regional Manager of the State Council on Development, Developmental Disabilities. Sheridan, what are you seeing with families, with individuals in the Bay Area right now? And what can you do about it? Great. Thank you, Dave. And just to share a little bit about the California State Council on Developmental Disabilities. We are an independent agency that's established by both federal and state law. There's a state council in every state in US territory. Uh, and we'd like to partner with, we partner with people with disabilities, their families and their communities to work towards inclusion, access, equity, and all of these things, including what panelists have discussed so far, really impact us today so critically when it comes to COVID-19, both in preparation and response and next steps when it comes to policy and protocol. And what we're seeing is uh, it, it's amplified, as, as was said earlier, it's amplified the issues that so many individuals and their families currently have. And we need to focus on making sure that their voices are lifted up, 
We need to focus on representation. Representation matters, we know that. So when it comes to whether it's communities, public health departments, education, employment, uh, you name it, we need to make sure that we have access and inclusion and strong representation from the developmental and other disability community, their families, the professionals that serve them, many of which are essential workers on the front line every single day and don't have enough access to PPE and to other gear to be able to do what they need to do to support and change lives. So these are these are all things that we can that we can collectively do. We can say who's at the table and make sure that people with disabilities are at the table working on practice and protocol and response. A couple of things I want to share based on the response that we've heard from Californians with developmental and other disabilities. It's helped us both prepare and respond to COVID-19 here in California in just a couple of ways. And, and these will be very helpful for anybody who's tuning in today. So we were listening. We were listening to people with disabilities and their families and realizing information was flying everywhere. Resources were flying anywhere, everywhere. But a lot of these resources weren't in plain language. And a lot of these resources didn't take people with access and functional needs and people with disabilities into account. And so that meant that those folks and their families were still struggling to get accurate information, helpful information that was relevant to their lives. And so what we did is we compiled and where we didn't see good resources, we created good resources. And many times hand in hand with people with disabilities. And we have all of these posted on our website and we'll continue to. So the website is scdd.ca.gov. And I just wanna share some of the resources that you will find on there. And uh, I also wanna give a shout out to some of the other wonderful, wonderful partners, community partners in California and nationally that have a lot of resources right now that are helpful for people with disabilities and their families. But we have on our website, everything from how to stay healthy, plain language information by and for people with developmental disabilities. Uh, we have frequently asked questions from family members and people with disabilities. We have a whole video series filmed by and for people with developmental disabilities on how to respond, prepare, and to stay safe in this COVID-19 pandemic. We have activities for sheltering in place, how to, how to handle shelter in place. We have information about COVID-19 and the IDEA when it comes to education. We have fact sheets on social security, the stimulus packages, what to do if you've lost your job as someone with a disability, or if your work hours have been reduced. We have information about coronavirus scams and fraud alerts. Unfortunately, we're seeing a rise in those, many times impacting or targeting people with disabilities and their families. And then we also have a variety of resources in Spanish, Mandarin, and Vietnamese. And that's just the State Council website. I mentioned some of our community partners. So I think of Disability Rights of California. I think of DREDIF. I think of Listos California. They have wonderful resources on their website, in many cases developed or compiled in partnership with professionals with disabilities and with the general public. So that's very important. And, and then there's a variety of other more specified resources too. And again, this all comes from listening, hearing, and making sure that we have representation from people with disabilities in terms of what do they need and how can we provide that in a way that works best for them and their families. And then I just wanna go back to when it comes to protocol and policy, whether that's on a governmental, local or state or federal governmental level or private business or just all of the various things that we as community members are going to need to do to successfully reopen the society and community and get back to whatever that new normal is, we need to make those decisions and make those plans hand in hand with and lifting up the voices of people with developmental and other disabilities and their families. That is the only way we need to make sure that they're represented. And in the meantime, as we're working to do that, going back to some of the wonderful uh, tips and tools that we heard earlier from panelists, it is critical that people with developmental and other disabilities have access to treatment and testing and care and are protected from healthcare discrimination. It's important that the direct service professionals that are serving them have access to personal protective equipment uh, and are prioritized for that equipment as well as for testing. We need to make sure people with disabilities and their families have the resources now to sustain themselves during the shelter in place and then are part of the planning process of how we're going to reopen. 
So we're sure, going to continue to do that. Sure, and I'm going to jump in real quick. I'm going to go to Vance in a moment, then I'm going to go to Mispa and Carrie. But Sheridan, while you're, while, you, while you're there, you made so many things go through my mind because one of the tough things for me at this second in the middle of COVID-19 and this crisis, my son is in a day program filled with other people who were diagnosed autistic in a crammed setting that I know he cannot go back to. And I know many other parents are wondering, how do I let my child go into a situation that's not safe? And then what's the alternative? What is safe? So what do we do from now on in this brand new world? You know what I mean? Uh, absolutely. And I'm so glad you brought that up, Dave. A couple of things. We want to make sure that states get support from the federal government to invest in HCBS. That's home and community-based settings. Right. So those are settings and services for people with disabilities and for other populations so that they can access the supports, the tools, the professionals in their communities. OK, so we got to get away from wherever possible large congregate settings, which we know is it is a significant additional risk for anybody in these in these conditions, in this pandemic condition. So that's important that states have the resources to really invest in home and community based settings. And then we have to recognize, to your point, your son's program and many, many other programs, thousands of programs just across California alone and many more across the nation. We will not be able to go back to that old normal. So we need to work towards the new normal. The new normal, we don't have a plan for. We don't have funding necessarily for yet. There's a lot of work that needs to be done still. And so it's governmental agencies, it's people with disabilities in their families, it's disability advocates, it's local governments all needing to work together to map that out. So likely, both for schools, for day programs, and for other types of supports, things are going to look different. We're going to see new program designs that have to roll out and we have to make sure we have the funding for those so that people can access supports and services and not be jammed like sardines on a bus, right? Traveling for, in some cases, multiple hours a day just to get to and from programming. We need to think about uh, how, do we, how, do we, how do we continue to provide and get better at providing individualized, person-centered, directed services. We have some wonderful tools now here in California, and other states have wonderful tools as well, but we need to invest in those tools. We need to work with the professionals that are currently working with people with disabilities, both children and adults, to make sure that we have a plan to reopen safely. That might look um, like a very different design for many people. That may look like programs at different times or smaller groups rather than larger groups or more customized one-to-one -one supports. So there's a lot of work, both from the policy end, the funding end, which is critical, and then making sure that these systems and services and the people they serve, people with disabilities, that they all get the support and training they need to do that. And what we're seeing is we're seeing the community hungry to get to work on this. So we're seeing people with disabilities and their families, the DSPs that support them, direct service professionals, the nonprofits and the agencies that serve them, and the state departments that are responsible for funding these services. Everyone needs to work together to be able to have the guidance, the funding, the trainings and support to make this happen and to keep people as safe as possible. Well, I'm so glad we have you where we have you in the state government. And Vance Taylor, I'd like you to jump in, pick up on, on what Sheridan's been saying. You're with the Office of Access and Functional Needs at the, at the Governor's Office of Emergency Services. How, what can you add to what Sheridan just said? I appreciate what Sheridan said, everything from the way that we communicate to the way that we're actually implementing these programs. Um, if we take a step back, I think what we have to recognize is anytime there's a disaster, no matter what the type is, whether it's a fire, a flood, an earthquake, or a pandemic, there is a disproportional impact on people with disabilities, older adults, anyone with an access or a functional need. And so when we look at this pandemic, it's no different. In fact, this particular pandemic is 
especially cruel in that it places at highest risk anyone that's older or anyone that has an underlying medical health condition. And so what we look is as we ask those individuals, all Californians, but especially those individuals in the highest risk categories to shelter in place, we have to ensure that we're providing them with the support networks and the support services that are required for them to be able to follow that order in a safe but a responsible way. So if you've got people that they can't leave now because they can't uh, take that risk, how do they get groceries? How do, they, how do we do a wellness check? How do we make sure that if they're sick, they get the medical attention that they need, right? So we have people, for example, that are asking, uh, look, I've got COVID-like symptoms, but I rely on accessible paratransit services. Are they willing to pick me up, right? How do I even go to get the test? And then we've got people that say, I've got an uh, in-home support provider care tenant that comes to my house, um, but they're impacted by COVID, so they're not going to come. So they're afraid to get something, so they don't want to leave. Um, and so how do we do that? How do we, how do we manage that? So the governor's been very proactive about trying to ensure that these types of gaps are not only recognized, but that they're addressed. Um, some of that is through prioritization. Right? We have to prioritize uh, things like testing or access to resources for people that are in these highest threshold categories. Uh, part of that's been by having sort of this call to action where we're looking for volunteers. The governor asked people to go online and volunteer and 20,000 people signed on the first day. So what does that say about Californians? And not just the, the good nature, uh, I think, posture or position that we have, but the way that we're willing to recognize the need to lift one another particularly during these circumstances. Uh, the governor says you never stand taller than when you bend down to lift another. And I agree with that statement. I think we're proving that most Californians agree with that statement as well. And so we're seeing neighbors helping neighbors. We're seeing volunteers provide care. We're seeing businesses that are, are saying, look, if you've got a disability, if you're in a high threshold category, we'll deliver your groceries for free. We'll open up our business hours. Uh, Costco, for example, has select hours designed specifically for people with disabilities and their care providers to go in. And so it takes that whole of community effort it's bigger than any one person. But if we're not deliberate in the way that we approach these things, if we are not intentional in the way that we communicate, and notice from the governor's on, he's got an interpreter there. That's because we have to be intentional about making sure everybody gets the message. When we set up the drive through testing sites, we were deliberate about saying these are the physical access requirements that have to be in place at those sites. When we set up the alternate care sites, like at Sleep Train Arena, we said when people come in, they have to have full wraparound services because whether or not you have a disability, you have the right to receive equal 
physical and programmatic access to all of the resources that California has to get. And so we've, we've done a, a good job of approaching that, which is not to say uh, that it's perfect. Right? It's never perfect. But we will push, and we will be innovative, and we will continue to strive to lift each other in whatever way is necessary to make sure that we can make it out of this okay. Vance, I really, really appreciate your comments, and I want to hear more from you. We're, we're going to do a couple of things, but first, Mista and Carrie, I, I want to talk to you real quick, but you're so important. You created Joshua's Gift. You've heard some of the comments, and one of the things I really wanted this event to be, I wanted us to really put a face on autism, and I wanted to learn more about you, your reaction to the comments of, of Patrick and Sheridan and Vance and John and Lucretia and Dr. Gerard that you've heard so far. Well, what's your reaction at this point? It's breath. It's been breathtaking. We've, we're just soaking it all in because we are parents of our son Joshua, who is um, who was diagnosed with autism. And oh, by the way, today is Joshua's birthday. So we want to send a public shout out to happy birthday. Happy birthday. Wow. Happy, happy, birthday. <laughs> happy birthday, Joshua. <laughs> Thank you. Um, but it's just been such an informative session. And uh, we're so grateful to all of the panelists involved. Um, there's never too much information that we can learn. And, and the takeaway here is that there's been information that have been shared with us that we can use and apply in our daily lives, especially around COVID-19, because just like many other families that are listening in, we are very concerned about um, COVID-19 and this pandemic and the impact that it's having on not just our lives, but the lives of many families around the world. And, um, and knowing that we, especially with a son who's more vulnerable, um, knowing that we are very restricted in, in what we can do and where we can take him. And for, um, for someone like Joshua, who's also in, always in motion, um, extremely active, um, it's, 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 you know, he's still trying to adjust to this change and his, his, whole, his, his entire schedule um, has been restructured to accommodate him. And that's really been a challenge. And I'm sure it's been a challenge for many families out there. We've been getting the emails and we've been getting the messages from the families out there. And we want them to know we hear you and we're here to help. And that's what this forum is really all about. To hopefully shed some light on your situations to also help you um, understand some of the things that you can be doing within your homes and while you're sheltered in place from these amazing panelists that's providing information and resources for us. And uh, Kerry, do you, yeah, go ahead, Kerry. Yeah, hi, hi, thanks, Dave. So I was just gonna say, um, well, my wife, she, she always articulates things perfectly. Uh, I was gonna just bond with you, Dave, and Patrick. So again, having a son, uh, he's, he's 19 today, uh, who's autistic and, you know, I think Patrick said something. I've learned so much from him more than I could ever teach him, you know, and I'm, I'm still not the most patient person in the world, but the patience that I have is because of him. I've learned from him. Um, and just as, as Patrick said, um, you know, not being judgmental of people, just looking at people for who they are being more understanding and more empathetic of people in their situations. Um, so, you know, and, and that's, and, and he is a blessing, you know, these, these, these kids, these adults who are now autistic and without disabilities, they are a blessing. And, uh, and um, you know, God put them here because he knew that we could take care of them. Right. He knew that we were able to take care of these, these beautiful blessings. And so that's, that's, that's amazing. Um, I wanted to say quickly about, um, you know, the school situation. I mean, it, it, it's stressful, school situation and, and work situation, you know, because we're like, well, people, I mean, all, all of us are like, well, okay, so we're out of school for, for you know, a long period of time, schedules change, 
uh, you know, our kids, autistic kids, you know, they're not, they don't handle change so well generally uh, just for long periods of time. So you're trying to help them adjust to that. And then you're thinking about, okay, well, they can't be at home by themselves, right? So, okay, so we, we obviously both work, parents work. So taking time off, well, you know, is your, is your company, you know, going to work with you, right? Are they going to, you know, offer paid leave or not? Are they going to make you use, you know, your normal leave and use all that up? And then what do you do? So these are all the kind of things that I'm sure that families are thinking about, some things that we are, we're having to think about as well. We have been we've been extremely blessed, especially with Cisco, um, and and I I cannot and I, I cannot say it enough. And it starts with the leadership all the way to the top, with um, Chuck, the CEO, and uh, and his leadership team as well. That and putting us at peace. Um, and I was listening into one of Chuck's meetings, and he kept emphasizing, I don't want families to be really worried and concerned about. The jobs right now you're at home in in unique situations and a lot of us as parents who are full-time workers we are now um we're now caretakers care providers in our homes as well and so we are we have become you know employees but we are we have become therapists now we're the occupational therapists we're the speech therapists we're the aba therapists in the home mm -hmm. and um and we have to we are, we're the ones that have to adjust um, just as well. And so thank you. Thank you for asking, Dave. You, you both spoke so eloquently, and I really, really appreciate that. And in the midst of all of this, and I want to show you a video in just a moment, in the midst of all of this, keeping in mind, we're still in the middle of this crisis. In the middle of it, as I heard one person say, we're in the second inning of a nine-inning game. There's so much more ahead, and none of us know where we're going or how it's going to end. And when you add in autism, developmental disabilities, wow. It leads me to something else. And, Kerry, I'm so, I'm so glad you and Patrick uh, spoke on this, and, and I get it. As a dad, often we, 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 we think we can fix everything, or at least we want to. And you, you face the situation of what do you do when you don't know what to do, but you just love your family and your child. And often we don't get a chance. Well, I've, I've, learned, I've done a lot of crying and uh, learned how to cry all over again because of my love for David. But the, the feelings of dads, it goes so deep. And that's why I, I, I'd like you to see this video from some dads. My first reaction was a lot of crying. And I locked myself in the room for like three days. I thought that for sure I could fix whatever was wrong with him. First I wanted to find out what autism was. Most people have no contact with, with autism and I, I was among them. By the way, this is my son David, David Emmanuel. My son is Ophir. Our son, his name is Caston Joshua Rich. My son's name is Jason. I have a 21-year-old daughter, and her first name, Kaylani, means queen because she's the queen of our house. And he's very affectionate. He's very kind and gentle to the people that he knows. He loves everybody. He's, he's a sweet, passionate, adorable kid. He's just an incredible young man. One in 45 children are diagnosed with autism today. Nobody can do everything, but everyone can do something. Never doubt that you can make a difference. Be a friend to a person with autism. Shout out to Autism Awareness. There's a lot of love there from the dads to all of you and to our families. Dr. Sherrod, let me go back to you and I'm still going to go around to everybody, but Dr. Sherrod, I, I really want to get your thoughts without getting too political. Are we doing everything we can relating to COVID-19 right now? If you could talk to Dr. Fauci and the others relating to autism and people with special needs, what would you say? Uh, thank you for that question. I think that's a very good question. But let me just say that uh, after listening to the speakers from the governor's office, um, 
Mr. Taylor, I think, and Sheridan. Um, I'm feeling really good about what we're doing here in the state of California. And I actually think that Governor, uh, Governor Newsom is doing an excellent job, and this state's approach to the pandemic could be a model for the nation. What I would say to Dr. Fauci is that we need to get a model plan in place that collaborates with all of the states from the national level to the state level to the local level. Because now there is a lot of free willing on the states. They're kind of allowed to do their own things. And I don't think that's going to mitigate properly the pandemic. We're, being, we're putting a lot of lives at risk. But from hearing from the governor's office, you would think, I feel safe. I'm glad to be in the state of California. Because I think we're doing the appropriate things. And I just heard Mayor Garcetti for LA County, everybody now can be tested, whether you have symptoms or not, for free. So we need more testing, more contract tracing. We, we need to go after this virus aggressively. We need to hunt it down. And that means doing the contact tracing, isolating, and quarantine. That's the only way we will really get a pandemic under control. But you know what, uh, Mr. Clark, I didn't actually outline for you the presentation of these patients, and I think it's relevant when it comes to children with autism. You know, the classic symptoms of fever, cough, and shortness of breath is not seen all the time in young children. Um, the kids are actually less affected in this particular pandemic, but they can. Everybody is at risk for uh, getting infected with the virus. But children, the virus attacks the lungs, the liver, the kidney, and the gastrointestinal tract. So you can present with symptoms of diarrhea, abdominal pain, um, not feeling well, fatigue, overall body aches, or just in autistic kids, just a change in behavior could be an indication that something different is going on with this child and maybe I need to get uh, him to the emergency room, he or she to the emergency room um, to, to be checked out. But I think until we get a national approach similar to what we're doing here in California, we are going to be in really, really big trouble. And Dave, may I uh, jump in here to, to add on to this as I'm trying not to cry after watching that video as well. Uh, one of the things, ahead, yeah, uh, one of the things that I did in the Obama administration was preparing for for pandemics and should things uh, come along. And Dr. Sharad is so right in that we need to fix things. You also had that beautiful narrative about dads just wanting to fix things. And when it comes to disabled people, when it comes to autistic people. We can't be fixed. This is who we are. This is who we'll, we'll be. And once you realize that, it, in part it's freeing, but then in part it's overwhelming because you start realizing all the things in society that need to be fixed. And I can tell you, as autistic kids grow up to be autistic adults, our hearts break for parents and the lack of resources that they have. And we want to fix things for them. And we don't have resources to do that ourselves. And if there's a silver lining in all of this, uh, uniting the thread that you are saying and the video is saying and what Dr. Sherrod is saying is coming out of this. Let us use this as an opportunity to fix things. And alluding back to what uh, Sheridan said about rethinking services, rethinking approaches, rethinking things that parents need, that we need um, for health and for education. So I'm eternally hopeful in that regard. And I'll stop talking because I will start crying <laughs> if I can <laughs> John, it's okay. John, you are spot on. I appreciate you so much. I'm going to go to Lucretia in just a moment, but Sheridan, pick up on what you just heard. And I just, I really want to know, I know that there's so much to fight for. Do you feel we have the fight in us to get it, uh, to make it happen? From your position, do we have it? We have it. Dave, we so have it. What you've heard today from, from our panelists, and just to pick up again where we left off and what John had shared and others has shared, we can. We, we have seen incredible stories of resilience 
and examples of leadership from the disability community working hand in hand with other organizations, whether they be governmental, um, you know, other uh, public and private entities. We're seeing such strong leadership. We just need to listen, include, highlight, make sure the representation is there. You know, I think about groups like the Autistic Self Advocates Net Net Self Advocacy Network. I think about um, some of the wonderful work around COVID response that has come out recently from mutual aid databases and disability ally forms. It's all grassroots developed and, and spread throughout communities. Some of that has been shared from SINS Invalid and from RADCOM's network, Disability Justice Culture Club. Uh, I've attended a webinar from Health Justice Commons, which was very powerful. The wonderful work of Alice Wong and the Disability Visibility Project. People First Chapters. We're seeing self-advocates stand up, uh, use the tools and supports and services, partner with others, and really lead, give instruction, give guidance, give mutual aid, and give us the path forward in terms of practice, protocol, policy, regulations, and just what people need every single day to get through this. So to answer your question, yes, we, we have it in us. We have the talent and the expertise here in the community and we just need to listen. And you know, going back to what we said earlier, we don't have to fix people. There's nothing wrong. We're, our people are, are wonderful. This is an opportunity for us. This is an opportunity for all of us to fix the things in our community, the systems in our community that we know could use fixing. Not just for people with autism and people with other disabilities, but for all people. You know, going back to universal design. Universal design is good for all of us. All of us benefit when everybody is thought of and included. So well said, Sheridan. And that leads me to Lucretia. And then I'm going to go back to, back to Patrick as well. But Lucretia, I know we're in a new world. It, we literally have turned upside down. We all know that. And none of us really know what, what's going to happen after we finish uh, turning round and around and how long that road is. But I know you believe, Lucretia, in the create, creative, creative arts and engaging with people creatively through art, through painting and things like that. And why do you feel so strongly about that? Well, it's an outlet for individuals. As we're going through this new world way of life, um, it's going to be, it's emotional. And the one thing that we need to be careful about and take notice of is our mental well-being. It's okay to feel angry. It's okay to feel scared. It's okay to feel the anxiety. But what it is not okay is to let that be prolonged over an extended period of time. As someone mentioned earlier, this is going to be a nine inning and maybe some extra innings. We're just in any one or two. So my concern is that the families, particularly the parents, there are now full-time caregivers. There are also educators that are needing to be um, wearing different hats now that they've never worn before for their children who are experiencing this new way of life, that they need to take care of themselves as they can take care of their, their child or their loved ones who are identified with having autism. They have to be healthy as we go through this journey. And it's going to, it's challenging and it's going to be remain challenging. But there are some tips that individuals can do, like create some art, take a piece of paper. You don't have to be an artistic um, expert. Just take a piece of paper, some colored pencils, just doodle be a distraction for the individual. You will, you, you will use a different side of your brain. It'll be a very positive and healthy release. Uh, one of the things that you can do is to sing. I mean, you don't have to have the greatest voice in the world, but just go ahead and just sing out loud. Dance like nobody's watching. It's okay. You have to release that stress, reduce that stress level so that you can be healthy and be able to take care of the individuals who are going to need you more than ever before. 
Well said, Lucretia. And that leads me to the fact that there, this panel is so good. We, we're getting chat questions from the people who are watching us. And here's one of the questions. And I open this up, whoever would like to attack. How, how can parents that are separated properly co-parent during COVID-19? I'm going to throw this out. Um, Dr. Sherrod, you got a smile on your face. A response? I, actually, uh, we have Zoom now. Uh, that's assuming that they have the technology. We can actually do our Zoom parenting, co-parenting, Zoom conferences with the child. Um, I think that that would be very helpful. But I also wanted to uh, address something that Lucretia brought up, and that is the mental attitude. and. I think we all need to keep a positive mental attitude during this, this outbreak because, you know, anger, worry, and doubt all suppresses your immune system, which actually puts you at greater risk for getting an infection. So what she's talking about in being, you know, being in joy, being creative, do some yoga, do the meditation, prayer and meditation both have been documented, evidence-based to be healing for your body. So don't live in fear during this time. That's false evidence appearing real. Because as Sheridan said, we have the resilience. We can do this. And I'd like to repeat that healthcare, and I think Taylor said this, healthcare is a right. I think if we move forward with that in mind, we can encompass and take care of everybody. We have to stand in our truth, as John was saying. We have to be who we are. And everybody is valuable by birthright. You were put here to be a beneficial presence on this planet. So you have a reason, and you need to ask your quest yourself these questions. Who am I? Why am I here? What is my purpose? And I think if we move forward with a positive mental attitude, and of course we have to include the community because us working together collectively, we can conquer this pandemic and get back to a new normal. It will be a change. We will not ever go back to what we were doing before. We'll definitely have a change in our lifestyle, but it's all for the better. Doctor, I believe it because you said it. I believe it. And, and that leads me right to Patrick. Patrick, here's another question from, a, from our viewers. Is there information that can be shared with families who may be just getting a diagnosis for the first time and they're trying to navigate their feelings, their resources, and this virus? I, I remember when I first heard, I didn't know what to do, what to say. I didn't know what to do with my hands. I didn't know what to do. So Patrick, what would you say to a family just now being exposed and introduced to, to autism? I, I, I would say a couple things, Dave. Thanks for the question. Um, first, just to add something to what Dr. Sherrod said, a lot of the po folks listening to this are from Cisco. Um, don't use Zoom, use WebEx. It's way better. Um, Zoom is, is, by the way, developed by the Chinese. Um, it's got security vulnerabilities, so while everybody in the planet's using Zoom, I encourage them to use WebEx. Cisco came out with a cost-free trial of WebEx, and truly, it truly is better. Most of intelligence agencies and people that need highly secure communications use WebEx. So uh, just a little plug in for Cisco. <laughs> um, but but back, to the, the um, the, back to the point about what do you do when you first find out. I mean, we all remember that day. Dave, you remember it like it was yesterday, so do I. I remember everything that day. Um, I mean, it just is it's, it's in, in absolutely emblazoned in your, in your mind. It's something you'll never forget. But what I would say in this, again, talking maybe more to a Cisco audience here, there's a great resource within Cisco. It's called the Special Needs um, um, Special Kids um, Group. I don't know what the official name is. But we started a number of years ago. There's a gentleman named Simon Powers that works at Cisco that is leading this group now. It's the Special Children's Group. Um, 
it's all parents of kids with special needs. Everybody in that group are kids with um, parents of kids with special needs, and the whole purpose of that group is to provide the kind of you know sort of guidance, support. You know, D Dave, you would be a great resource for somebody who's kid was recently diagnosed with autism. You've lived that way for a number of years, so have I, right? So lots of things that you could probably advise a newly diagnosed parent, um, and honestly, that's what the special children's group does. So, you know, I encourage the Cisco folks to reach out to Simon. He's a great resource. They do amazing stuff, and it's a lot of one-on-one, -on -one, very confidential. Um, when I was involved with this group, when I was at Cisco, Dave, um, in team, uh, you, you, there were people that would tell us things that their own managers didn't know because they were looking for support and counsel and collaboration and uh, sharing this a lot of what you talked about, right? It's the, it, and Dr. Sherrod as well, it's, it's about supporting the, the, both the individual, the family, and, and the whole uh, community to support and surround that person and there's no better resource than people that have, been, have walked a couple miles in those shoes. Honestly, my view, uh, even if they're not experts, they're not mental health experts or doctors, the reality of it is they can provide a lot of guidance about how you ought to look at your life, what you ought to do different, how you might want to adapt, what you do and how you do it um, to create the best example, the best environment for, for, for your children, your family. And Patrick, I'd also advocate for autistic people being a resource in that as well. I guarantee you there's autistic people working at Cisco. Through my work through Pivot Neurodiversity, I'm usually helping companies support their neurodiverse employees, you know, autism, ADHD, right. dyslexia. But tacked onto that is always parents of those kids as well. And just as we find that neurodiverse people aren't understood and supported in the workplace, parents of neurodiverse children and other disabilities feel like they're not understood and supported in the, the workplace. And where we've developed those kind of networks for neurodiverse employees and they've connected with parents, or we've developed those for parents and they've connected with neurodiverse employees, all of a sudden you have a group of people who get you more than any other people. And you could ask questions um, and have those allies. Yeah, John, just to add, yeah, to like to there is a Cisco group, an employee resource group focused on people with disabilities. And it's people that work at Cisco that either are advocates or they have a disability themselves. Lots of folks that you know are on the spectrum or have other physical disabilities. It's called CDN, the Cisco Disability Awareness Network. It's headed up by a woman named Susan Dubecker. Sheridan, you've met Susan. Um, Susan Dubecker, if you don't know where to go, send an email to Susan Dubecker. Um, she's in Amsterdam. She's fantastic. She leads CDN. That's exactly right, uh, John. That's what CDN does, right? It's people talking to people, and it's employees talking to employees, and it's employees talking to parents, and it's, uh, it's a great community and a great resource that people at Cisco have that's unique to Cisco. Lots of companies don't have uh, necessarily employee resource groups, and that's where other people have to come in. But at Cisco, there are resources available within the company that can provide counsel, support, and advocacy for people with disabilities and their families. Great. And, and, and so right, just sir. so you know, too, I am actually a part of that group, and, and that group that Simon Spearheads is actually listening in right now as well, because I sent them the invitation to, to join us. Um, also, it, it, they do amazing work, absolutely. And also, too, um, just as res a, another resource, I recall Carrie and I actually hosting um, a parent support group um, for, for years, and it was for parents that were just coming in and just getting the diagnosis. We knew we know what that's like, and we that's knew how we felt at that time, and to be able to have other parents to talk to and um, to get information from, to ask questions, to help you navigate your way through through the process, through the process, and through the diagnosis, IEPs, you know, and um, and we we definitely um, can relate, you know, and so there are a lot of other parents out there as well, and and even you know with where with Sheridan's group because because um, the State Council on Developmental Disabilities they do a lot of things with with families as well, you know, and they have a lot of resources there as well. So, so thank great, you for sharing. Great, great, great point. 
Sure, and then, sure, then you want to pick up on that. Uh, I'm sure you have something to add to this. Yeah, I'm, I'm loving the discussion and, and just loving uh, what everybody's talking about now, Pat, and it's fun, Carrie, and uh, have to say that for workplaces that aren't uh, leveraging and learning from uh, employees that have loved ones with disabilities or employees with disabilities, here's your chance. Uh, so many of us know of a business or a company that we've either worked for or we have a spouse that works for them or friends or neighbors that work for them or they're a neighborhood business maybe. This is the time. Are they listening to and including? Uh, do they have a diverse workforce? Uh, are they listening to that diverse workforce? Are they learning from that diverse work workforce? Uh, people with disabilities and then family members of those with disabilities. There is so much to gain from that kind of inclusion and diversity in the workplace. And now more than ever, as all businesses are looking forward and facing uh, our new reality with COVID-19, we can't, we can't undo that, right? We can only move forward. This is a great time for businesses of all sizes and from all backgrounds to really listen to the diverse workforce and, and how to prepare and move forward. And um, I just wanna give a shout out, and I know that this is close to, to many of our panelists' hearts as well, so many of the essential workers right now that are that are putting their lives on the line to help others are people with disabilities, people with autism and other disabilities. I just want to give a shout out because oftentimes uh, people with disabilities, professionals with disabilities are not acknowledged for the work that they're doing. And right now, so much of our essential workforce includes people with disabilities. Also, a shout out to the direct service professionals that every day are going out there to care for and support work and help educate uh, and lift up people with disabilities who are sheltering in place. That's critical. That's life-saving work, critical work, and it's oftentimes not the work that's heard when people talk about essential workers. So just want to highlight those two workforces right there and how valuable they are to all businesses at all times, but especially now as we face COVID-19. Great point. Well said, Vance Taylor. We're winding down, but what are your thoughts on all this? Uh, you know, it's it's great. It's it's music to my ears. I, I think that we are fortunate to be at a place where there really is this recognition that it, what's being asked for isn't anything that's quote unquote special. Right? What's being asked for is a recognition that. Everybody deserves the same equity when it comes to services and care. But everybody deserves equity when it comes to opportunities in life, whether that's in the way we deal with uh, health or whether that's the way that we look at employment, that everybody contributes, that everybody is of value. And being able to recognize that value, I think, helps change our perspective. Right? That this is no longer about us uh, thinking about things in the traditional mindset. This historical idea that you know, if you had a disability, that you needed a handout of some sort. I think this is about us recognizing that the way we take care of one another says something about us as a state. And said something about us as individuals. And I think it's also about recognizing that were it not for the bravery and the courage, the hard work and dedication, and the contribution that people with disabilities are making, all of our lives would have gaps. All of us would be at a disadvantage. And so the least we can do is make sure that when it comes to recognizing that there are going to be access and functional needs in a pandemic situation or any other disaster, that we're responsible and deliberate in the way that we plan, prepare, respond, and recover with those needs in mind. So I just want to thank everybody for their partnership. And I want everybody to understand this is an issue of commitment and of leadership, that California leads the nation and ultimately the world in inclusive planning, and that you're seeing the fruits of that every single day during this event. So 
It's, it's an incredibly well said, Vance. I, I appreciate that. Uh, we're about to turn things back over to Ms. Bet and Carrie, but before I go, I just wanted to say one, I'm not supposed to, I love you all. I want to hug you all because you, uh, you have been very special to me. You made this very special. Uh, I learned something from all of you. And, and I tell people when I talk about my son, the world of autism, and things like that, how my life has changed. I never would have asked to be the father of a child diagnosed with autism. But I began to realize that many of the things I've gone through, all of the time I spent in hospitals and intensive care, buying medicine and trying to revive my son from seizures, all of those things, Many of the things, all of the things I went through, it wasn't for me. It was for the person coming behind me. Yep. That new person who, who asked in the chat room, hey, I just got here. Somebody tell me, what, what am I going into? That's what that was for. And it took me a long time to realize that. Mm -hmm. that when I look at someone and say, yeah, I, I know what you're going through. They could look at me and say, yeah, you do know, don't you? Yeah. So I, I learned a lot. I learned so much from all of you. And once again, our panel, Dr. Jesse Sherrod, uh, Patrick Romzek in, in Michigan, Sheridan Nicolau, John Marble, Lucretia D. Clark, L. Vance Taylor, the best panel around I, I thank you all for letting me just spend time with you. And of course, Ms. Matt and Carrie, I, I thank you both for being the catalyst for all of this. And I'm going to turn things over to you both. Thank you. Lisa, thank, thank you. everyone. Thank you thank so you much. Guys, thank you, all the panelists. Right. Thank you, Dave. <laughs> we want to show some guys. Well, you're on start. Hello? Yes. This is Dr. Uh -huh. Rod. I, I, I have... Um, a quote from Marianne Williams, so my, I don't know, I think would be quite appropriate if you just give me a minute to. Uh, Absolutely. It points out the importance of each and every individual in this fight against the pandemic. You know, our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light, not our darkness, that most frightens us. We ask ourselves, who am I to be brilliant? gorgeous, talented, fabulous. Actually, who are you not to be? You are a child of God. Your plan small does not serve the world. There is nothing enlightened about shrinking so that others won't feel insecure around you. We're all meant to shine as children do. We were born to manifest the glory of God that is within us. It's not just in some of us. It's in each and every one of us. And as we let our own light shine, we unconsciously give other people permission to do the same. As we are liberated from our own fear, our presence automatically liberates others. Thank you. That is amazing. Thank you so much for that. Creating diversity certainly brings a much better outcome in life. And the first slide that we have up right now that we're showing you is, is um, essential workers that are working the front lines, putting their own lives on the line. And a lot of these workers are a part of the community of disabilities. We're so grateful to them. We, we send our heartfelt thanks and gratitude to them for doing this. They're out there and they're serving the public and uh, knowing the risk, and we are just so grateful and want to say thank you to them. Yeah. We also have, um, like on campus with the next slide, we have um, Aramark, and Aramark is providing meals for, this, for workers that are coming to work on Cisco's campus every day. And they too are putting themselves out there and putting themselves on the line, and they're doing an amazing job, and we just want to say thank you to them. We also want to say thank you to the, the um, ABM Corporation and ABM is, is working under WPR at Cisco. These workers are there making sure that the place is ready for us when we return. As you can see, they're doing a lot of cleaning and sanitizing 
um, the many buildings that we have on campus, and we're, we just want to recognize them because we're so grateful to them. Our ability to support families with disabilities is really due to the generosity of companies like Cisco. Um, and again, it starts from the top. And we're, we just want to say thank you to Irving Tan, who has sponsored and supported this forum for the last two years, and we could not do it without him. Um, we are so grateful to him and his team for, um, for supporting this forum and allowing us to be able to bring this to, to the um, audience. And we're also grateful to Kaiser Permanente. Kaiser Permanente has been monumental in, in the support that we have been receiving from them and has allowed Joshua's gift to help so many families that are out there. We were getting messages coming in as we have been on the air broadcasting. And there are so many families that are, that are in need right now that Joshua's gift has every intention of reaching out to and supporting. So we're, we would love for you just to continue to reach out to us. You can reach us at info at joshuasgift.org. And we would be more than happy to hear from you and hear what your needs and concerns are. Thank you to the entire panel. We could not have done this without you. And you do not want to miss this forum because the panelists are coming with a wealth of information and a ton of resources that we know you will be able to use. And we, we just can't thank you enough. And we really look forward to continued partnership with you long beyond the forum. Um, we're so grateful also to Dave Clark. Like you said in the beginning, Dave, you love us, Dave. We love you. Love I've you. been getting messages <laughs> as you've been on air and people are saying to us, Dave Clark is real. <laughs> yes, he is indeed. He has a big heart. And we're so grateful to him for um, being the um, moderator for, for this event. Thank you to everyone, the audience out there that um, are has been viewing the broadcast and also has been listening. We, we hear your, we've heard your questions and your concerns and uh, we're gonna do everything in our power to, to address them and to, to help you as well. Thanks to Carrie, Leslie, these are people behind the scenes, Stephanie that has been helping with the questions. We're so grateful also to Cisco TV and the production team Lauren, we could not have done this without you, and thank you for holding our hands through this entire process. <laughs> and thanks to my husband and my family as well, who has been, you notice you haven't heard Joshua. Joshua's usually a, in motion a lot, and, um, and his, his sister has been tremendous in, in watching him because we don't have the, uh, the professional um, caretakers in the home. It's us, just like many families. We're, we're blessed. So thank you so much for tuning in, everyone. Members use Cisco WebEx and Contact Center to collaborate with patients, donors, and their critical career network. And their data is secure, protected by Cisco Umbrella Security. Knowing what Max had to go through, what I had to do was easy. One person in the world was a match to me. It's pretty special. The Cisco network allows Be The Match to make matches faster than ever. And that's just the start of what's possible. I am excited to meet Max. I don't think he knows it yet, but he's always going to have a number one fan. Me and Dylan are DNA twins. <laughs>
and a life-altering donation, there's a bridge. Cisco, the bridge to possible. When someone asks, where were you when golf history was made? You don't want to say, at home on my couch. You want to be there. You want that connection. Not just watching history, but part of it. Welcome to the 2019 U.S. Open at Pebble Beach. The first U.S. Open championship in history to bring fully secure course-wide Wi-Fi to fans, players, broadcasters, and event organizers. We're not just talking about players' scores and ball positions. This is intent-based networking, the power of Wi-Fi 6 and data analytics in concert. Delivering super-fast connectivity, real-time video, sharing, wayfinding, and top tracer technology. For any event, any size, anywhere, this is Cisco's legendary network expertise to go. Now everyone, on the course and at home, can be part of the moment. Where were you when history was made? Between the game and the game as you've never known it, there's a bridge. Cisco. The bridge to possible. April 16th, 2018. This is Tokyo. This is Rakuten. These are Cisco executives invited to a meeting with Rakuten. This is Tarek Amin, CTO of Rakuten Mobile. This is Prakash Suthar, team leader from Cisco Customer Experience. Namaskar. Good morning. This is a story about doing something that's never been done before. Prakash. I need someone to help me build the world's first end-to-end -end cloud native network. We need a partner. Let's do it. In order for this to work, it has to be optimized for 5G. We'll design it from scratch. Fully automated. Fully virtualized. Cloud. Core. Transport. Virtual RAN. Everything. everything. It will be the first of its kind. Oh, yeah. You can figure it out. We can figure it out. This is their idea. It's an ambitious idea. An unprecedented idea. It's true. But this is what industry executives called it. Impossible. 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 But that didn't stop them, that just made them hungry. So Prakash, how about developers? We'll create a platform. Different systems. Different partners working, working together. together. What else? This is the plane that took the Rakuten team to San Jose. Okay, so it takes three weeks to implement a traditional radio site. With automation, we can do it in 10 minutes. And more secure. Zero touch. Zero defect. Ready for 5G. Just upgrade the software. This is Tarek's impressed face. This went on for months. We're going to need new hardware. Then we'll partner with your vendor. But our design? You got it. Then Tarek said. And we want you to manage the whole chain, oversee the integration of vendors and partners. We're on it. February 3rd, 2019. This is Rakuten and Cisco and their impossible idea making their first call. Oh my God. And the world just changed. Rakuten and Cisco customer experience. The right solutions, the right technology, most importantly, the right people. Between ideas and invention, there's a bridge. Cisco, the bridge to possible. Every once in a while, an opportunity comes along. A really big opportunity. As in six trillion dollars big because that's how much business is shifting to the cloud-native countries and the companies that are capitalizing on Wi-Fi everywhere with security. Like the Netherlands, where smart ports and connected highways are helping alleviate one of the most dense transportation networks in the world. In Italy, where Dallara helps automakers around the world make high-performance cars faster and safer. Cisco is digitally transforming their business, the way they work, think, and interact. At Rakuten in Japan, who partnered with Cisco to build the first cloud-based and fully virtualized mobile network. A model for the future of telecommunications around the world. Oh my God. The hyperfast connections and the wildly transfigured networks they will spawn is going to change everything. And only Cisco has the knowledge, the experience, and the solutions to make it happen. Between the internet that's here and the internet that's coming, there's a bridge. Cisco, the bridge to possible.
Ambitious dreams, like making the best tea in Japan and sharing it with the rest of the world. This is Namiki Ishiyama. She grows tea with her family in Ibaraki Prefecture, Japan, on their farm established in 1871. Namiki sells her family's tea online at the marketplace created by Rakuten, a global leader in internet services. Namiki's ambitious dreams may come true sooner than she thinks, because the world. Is about to change. Rakuten has partnered with Cisco to do something that has never been done before: to build a new mobile network, cloud-based, fully virtualized, and optimized for the coming 5G revolution. This is Tarek Amin, CTO at Rakuten Mobile. My belief is this platform is going to change everything. This is 5G: more data, more power, new tools we can't yet imagine, artificial intelligence in the palm of our hand. Making connectivity affordable. I think Rakuten and Cisco is going to do that, and that's going to change the ecosystem of telecommunication in this country and across the world. What will 5G mean to Namiki's tea business? Rakuten and its partner Cisco are excited to find out. My husband and I are sixth-generation tea farmers. My son will be the seventh generation. That is my dream. Between tradition. And transformation. There's a bridge. Cisco, the bridge to possible. Running makes me feel happy. My favorite part about cross country is like the mental part. I'm Max. When I was 11 years old, I was diagnosed with aplastic anemia. And if I didn't find a donor, I probably wouldn't be here right now. I'm Dylan, and I'm 22. Three years ago, I joined the registry at Be the Match. It was simple: just swab your mouth and send it in. Be the Match is a global database of donors. To save more lives, they needed to make more matches, so they consulted with technology integrator E Plus. The solution: cloud-based management made possible by Cisco UCS. Now, Be the Match team members use Cisco WebEx and Contact Center to collaborate with patients, donors, and their critical career network. And their data is secure, protected by Cisco Umbrella Security. Knowing what Max had to go through, what I had to do was easy. One person in the world was a match to me. It's pretty special. The Cisco network allows Be the Match to make matches faster than ever, and that's just the start of what's possible. I am excited to meet Max. I don't think he knows it yet, but he's always going to have a number one fan. Me and Dylan are DNA twins. <laughs> Dylan's like my brother. <laughs> Between a life-threatening disease and a life-altering donation, there's a bridge. Cisco, the bridge to possible. When someone asks where were you when golf history was made, you don't want to say at home on my couch. You want to be there. You want that connection, not just watching history, but part of it. Welcome to the 2019 U.S. Open at Pebble Beach. 
the first U.S. Open championship in history to bring fully secure course-wide Wi-Fi to fans, players, broadcasters, and event organizers. We're not just talking about players' scores and ball positions. This is intent-based networking, the power of Wi-Fi 6 and data analytics in concert. Delivering super-fast connectivity, real-time video, sharing, wayfinding, and top tracer technology. For any event, any size, anywhere, this is Cisco's legendary network expertise to go. Now everyone, on the course and at home, can be part of the moment. Where were you when history was made? Between the game and the game as you've never known it, there's a bridge. Cisco, the bridge to possible. April 16th, 2018. This is Tokyo. This is Rakuten. These are Cisco executives invited to a meeting with Rakuten. This is Tarek Amin, CTO of Rakuten Mobile. This is Prakash Suthar, team leader from Cisco Customer Experience. Namaskar, good morning. This is a story about doing something that's never been done before. Prakash, I need someone to help me build the world's first end-to-end -end cloud native network. We need a partner. Let's do it. In order for this to work,